I'm alone and tired. I like to get drunk and read Wikipedia. This is not exactly the purview of a distinguished and balanced individual, but you do learn things. Maybe you spend an hour skimming through Pakistani politics. Maybe you try and understand the Enron scandal without having your mind glaze over. Or maybe you find yourself on the article listing all of the wars involving France. And you go, damn, that's a lot of wars. And you skim up and down the vicissitudes of the nation of France. Sometimes they're doing good, sometimes less so. And then you come across this patch of history starting in 1792 when they start winning and winning and winning and winning despite the combined power of the rest of Europe to stop them. Welcome, beautiful, glorious listeners to No One Is Competent, the premier history comedy podcast on whatever app you are listening to us on. I'd put us against any show on planet Earth and say we're better uh, because my name is Azalea and I am a narcissist. And I am, of course, joined by the man, the myth, the legend, the J. Harry's Brunstead. J. how are we doing today? Uh, doing all right. Doing well enough. Um, just in the mood for talking about people blowing each other up with uh with black powder weaponry who isn't jay i you know i recently we've been getting a lot more play on our war involving episodes and i'm very curious to see if uh our uh shall we say gambit of giving the people blood pays off i want to see triple quadruple <laughs> digits on this episode yeah well, you know, this is a war that is a little bit overlooked. I talked a little bit about this in our last episode, but, you know, the War of the First Coalition kind of gets a bit of the shaft because everybody either just talks about the revolution, the politics of the revolution, or they talk about the Napoleonic Wars. Um, so even though this is a really big and important war, I mean, it saves the revolution. Um, that's not an exaggeration to say. It's not super well known, which hopefully we will rectify a little bit. Yeah, the War of the French Coalition is like essentially the French army, like constantly saving the revolution as the revolution constantly tries to kill itself uh, and kill the army at times. <laughs> but Jay mentioned last episode because th this is a somewhat weird situation because this is like kind of sort of part three of the French Revolution series here on No One is Competent. Uh, there will be very little context or domestic French politics or explanations of like the concert of Europe and the various states and goals of every country involved uh, we have already done that we made an episode about louis the 16th we made an episode about the outbreak of the war in the early stages of the french revolution that covers all of that go listen to episode 27 go listen to episode 28 we are go we're gonna raw dog we're gonna jump straight in we're going in no condom no lube we're, we're just plunging and flunging. You, you, you get me, Jay? We're, we're going right in. So get ready for some raw dog war history content. And while you are sitting back to relax or gearing up for your workout, you're in the car or whatever, go ahead and check us out on Twitter. Jay is at jharrys48, and I am at Azalea Wyatt. Please also go ahead and rate and review the podcast on whatever app you are on. If you're on YouTube, like, subscribe, leave us a question in the comment. We'd be happy to answer. Remember, folks, we are bringing you this premium, unbridled, titillating content with no advertisements, no sponsored, zero monetization. So give us a little bit of love Give us some rates, give us some reviews, make a sacrifice to 
the algorithm gods and tell some friends about the podcast. We definitely appreciate it. We also appreciate you reaching out to us on email at no one is competent at gmail.com. Give us some love, ask some questions, request podcast episodes. We are people of the people, and we love to do what you want. Anyway, Jay, who who do we all dig in to to sor- sources for for the episode? The the the, 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 the <laughs> give 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 start the podcast. All right. <laughs> So my primary source for this week's episode is The Wars of the French Revolution, 1792 to 1801 by Charles J. Esdale. Additionally, I'm also working off of The French Revolutionary Wars by Gregory Fremont Barnes. Um, For information on tactics, I've taken a little bit from a video called Napoleonic Infantry Tactics, A Quick Guide by Epic History TV. And also... Uh, Hopefully, we'll have some maps up during this episode, which I made, Uh, but the template I use for those maps comes from uh, Wikimedia, while some of the information I used comes from an artist known as Siowari, who can be found on DeviantArt. I uh, provided the research and writing for the French politics side of this podcast, Obviously, like last episode, the joke was we did like two thirds French politics and one third a uh, war. Uh, this time it's mostly war, but last time we kind of went through all of French politics to ninety four, and I will be sort of finishing the story uh, through the end of ninety five and kind of getting us into the end of the war, uh, just so we kind of get the complete saga of the French Revolution and what's going down during all of this shooting and booting. And I mostly drew from the Revolutions podcast series by Mike Duncan, as well as After Robespierre, The Thermidorian Reaction by Albert Mateus. I read a fucking book, Jay. Yeah, it's impressive. Just kidding. I read like 40 pages of a fucking book. Are you proud of me, Jay? I'm a mediocre white guy. You have you have to praise me for <laughs> doing the bare minimum. Otherwise, I'll throw a temper tantrum. I am, uh, let's say, uh, 40% proud of you. Oh, yeah, that's nah, a good just figure. kidding. I'm not going to throw a temper tantrum. There's never been a white guy cooler than me. I'll tell you that. So... War of the First Coalition, the first of the French Revolutionary Wars, 1792 to 1797. We got France on one side. We got a bunch of dudes on the other. A coalition, if you will. Austria, Prussia, Great Britain. And again, if you want to know all of the context for all of this stuff, listen to episode 28. Indeed. Yeah, really, you know, as we've said multiple times now, but I really just want to reiterate it just because this is a very complicated war. The French Revolution as a whole is famously complicated. Uh, My really, mind almost <laughs> really melted l- like last time trying to summarize the French Revolution. Yeah. Like, I got violently angry. Okay, <laughs> it is hard. Yes, yeah, so, so so do listen to those for politics and diplomatic maneuvering and everything. But just to get to it, you know, the War of the First Coalition begins on April 20th, 1792, with France's declaration of war on Austria. Now, as we've covered previously, contrary to popular belief, the monarchies of Europe did not all get together in an attempt to crush the revolution by force. You know, that's kind of the way that I think a lot of us learn about this if you if you learn about this war in like high school or whatever it's just like oh they all just hated the revolution and they wanted to put louis back on the throne but i don't think i was taught this in high school at all like not even in ap euro like i feel like this this war was just like a footnote before yeah i think like napoleon shows up i we have like i don't know like a paragraph in the textbook in ap (laughs) ap world about this or something like that (laughs) but yeah so Yeah, most of these other European countries have other concerns. Few of them actually wanted to go to war with France in 1792. 
you know, there was an ongoing political crisis in Poland, a civil war that would eventually lead to the partition of that country. And this meant that throughout this entire war that we're talking about, a lot of the Prussian and Austrian army will be stationed in the east, away from the fighting, because they're worried that a war will break out either between themselves or against Russia over, you know, the territories of Poland. You know, countries all kind of play different roles in the world. You know, the Turks be laying in the cut. The Swiss just kind of be up on their mountain hating everyone. Uh, the Poles are that messy bitch who everyone loves, everyone wants, everyone desires because they're just so fucking hot. And <laughs> the love triangles, various jealousies and whatnot over Poland just kind of tend to insert itself into pretty much like, I don't know, 80% of revolutionary European history and just muck up everything. Like, for a solid 150 years of interesting things happening in uh, Europe, time and time and time again, it'll you'll be like, and things were like kind of stabilizing, and then they started to fight over Poland again. <laughs> yeah, it, it, it do be like that. A trend that continued all the way up into 1939, which went swimmingly for everyone involved. Of course. Now, uh, speaking of wars, you know, Russia itself was coming out of a war against Turkey and Sweden, and therefore would not play a role in the war against France. Austria had also been at war with Turkey, and had faced a series of internal unrest following the reforms of the late Emperor Joseph II, and all this meant that Austria was deeply in debt, and thus really did not actually want a war with France. Ultimately, France declared war first, motivated by a pro-war fervor that was created by the Girondins and encouraged by some of the liberals. Austria would be joined in their effort by Prussia, who basically just jumped in the conflict as a chance to get some land off of France. Now, before we get into the war itself, it's worth going over the nature of warfare in the late 18th century. You know, like, how are these people fighting and the stabbing and the shooting and the moving of, of troops and horses and all that jazz? Given this episode will be the first in a series on the Revolutionary and Napoleonic Wars, it's good to get this out of the way at the beginning. Fun fact, folks, Jay tried to put this section in the last episode of the <laughs> podcast, and I made him take it out because that would have made the script 45 pages long. Jay is calling this a quick overview, but I, I, I think this is... Uh, pretty in depth anyway but we're talking about land warfare right now as the naval side is going to mostly come up in future episodes okay so armies of the late 18th century were composed of three major sections you got infantry cavalry and artillery infantry is like you know the people the soldiers on the ground they're necessary to capture territory, to take territory, to got do all of the things, you know. They are armed mainly with flintlock muskets, okay? These are smoothbore guns, lacking rifling, and loaded from the muzzle with a black powder and ball-shaped bullet. Now, if you don't know anything about guns, that basically means it takes a long time to reload them, and when you shoot them, they do not exactly fly where you're pointing them, all right? <laughs> e even the most experienced soldiers can only really fire two or three rounds a minute. They are largely inaccurate weapons, and you make up for this by having a lot of them, all right? Basically, you, you line up tons of, of dudes in formation like five ten more and have them all fire at once so you know even if like eight of them miss two of them will hit and you will be successful accuracy is going to be made even worse by the fact that when you're on the battlefield all of these weapons using black powder are permi 
are producing an immense amount of smoke that is going to make accuracy more of an aspiration than a reality. Just the fun thing about muskets is that if, if you ever see somebody load a black powder musket um, of this period, you don't just put the powder down the barrel. There's also a little, like, uh, a pan that you put a little bit of powder in, and that pan is then what the flint will, you know, the sparks from the flint will strike, and that'll send, you know, flame into the barrel. Uh, that pan is on the right side of the gun. And what that means is, you know, if you're standing Yikes. in the formation and there is a guy to your left, which there will be unless you are on the left, you will have sparks and smoke sprayed basically right into your face. And this is just happening to like everybody all the way down the line. Um, all the time. Yeah. <laughs> These weapons are really miserable. You'll see them in reenactments. They look like they don't have recoil, and that's because in, in reenactments, people are not using bullets. They're using, you know, low-powered blanks. These things kick hard. Um, muskets are really, really not nice. Yeah, and muskets are not nice weapons to use. Yeah, so my understanding generally of this, like, era of history, maybe we'll, I'm, I'm kind of getting fervor into this into like the the tactics but like my understanding of, of like armies at this time is like a, a big make or break was like the discipline of the men and like the reason that drill tactics was so Very important much this so. time is you you needed people who were experienced enough slash stupid enough to stand there and load their muskets and all fire at the same time while they were being shot at and then calmly reload and keep firing because, you know, that was the way that you put out as much DPS as possible and, and win the fight. But inexperienced people will, of course, you know, do, do the logical thing and, and run away from being shot at, which if you're ever drafted into a war is what I suggest <laughs> you do. Yeah. These muskets, of course, can be fixed with the socket bayonet, which is the sidearm sorts of these infantry armies. Now, they're not like have the bayonets on the guns all the time. Generally, you fix the bayonet to the musket when you plan to charge the enemy. You know, the, the commander gives the command, fix bayonets! And this is a maneuver typically only done when the opponent was close to breaking or when defending from an enemy infantry or cavalry charge. You, you know, it's you, you kind of, you got them on the ropes and you kind of want to break your spirits by having a bunch of dudes and sh sharp sticks charge at them, which is pretty effective traditionally. Yeah. Now, in terms of tactics and organization, infantry was divided into two categories, line infantry and light infantry. And these are largely just defined by the tactics they employ. Uh, for the most part, their weapons are not really any different. The standard unit of line infantry was the battalion, consisting of between 500 and 800 men, divided into companies of around 100 men apiece. The term line infantry comes from their most commonly used formation, the line, which is all companies formed up alongside each other with soldiers standing in a long, wide line, typically three ranks deep. The line was a powerful defensive formation, as it maximized the number of men who could fire their muskets while limiting the impact of artillery. You know, if a solid round uh, cannonball goes through this line, it's only going to knock over a couple men and then, you know, go behind it. As an offensive formation, though, it was not without its weaknesses. When advancing over uneven terrain, it was difficult to keep a line in good order, particularly with inexperienced troops. As such, some armies resorted to using the column in such situations, the column being a narrower formation, typically just two companies wide. The column was not designed to stop and exchange fire with the enemy. Instead, its purpose was to march into and through an enemy infantry line carried forward by its sheer mass. The French would become particularly notable for their use of columns during the Revolutionary Wars, but they did not invent the formation. Um, you know, some people will credit them for that. That's very much not true. As an example, the Russians heavily used columns during their wars with the Ottomans. And the other main type of infantry was the light infantry. Light infantry units were typically capable of forming lines if need be, 
but they were generally deployed in a much looser formation with individual soldiers having the liberty to spread out and fire from covered positions. Some light infantry units were even equipped with rifles instead of smoothbore guns, uh, but that would be the minority. Light infantry were used to screen and scout out ahead of the main body of an army, as well as skirmish with enemy units. So light infantry units are like scouts and, you know, dealing with like difficult terrain or like in a, in a sort of chaotic battle situation. Yeah. Whereas like the, the, the big sweeping battles on the rolling hills with thousands of people all shooting each other that we kind of think about for this period, that's line infantry. Yes. All right. Moving on to recruitment. European armies at the start of the War of the First Coalition were predominantly professional forces, their ranks filled with volunteers. Far from being seen as a noble profession, soldiers were looked down upon by wider society as little better than common criminals. The Duke of Wellington would famously describe the men under his command as the scum of the earth. The reason for this attitude was that the ranks of the infantry were drawn almost exclusively from the urban and rural poor. I could also insert a rant here about how soldiers were also the cops at the time and how everyone hates cops because <laughs> cops are bad and the spirit of the Third Amendment to the United States Constitution is essentially police abolition, but I won't. Soldiering was far from an idyllic profession. Discipline was harsh, with measures such as a lashing meted out for even minor infractions. Most officers viewed brute force as the only way to create soldiers capable of maneuvering, standing, firing, and reloading their weapons in the face of enemy fire in a battlefield dominated by smoke and sound. Also, apologies to the audience, but like... I have had a really long day of book writing, and also I ran a 5k a little bit ago in which I got like a really bad side stitch and like almost hurt myself. So like I'm tired and the Southern accent is going to come out a little more. <laughs> Terms of service were typically indefinite, though in practice, most soldiers would be let out once they reached an age where they were no longer seen as capable. The only men willing to sign on to such harsh way of life were typically those desperate for food, housing, and steady pay. Contrary to popular belief, conscription was on the books in most European countries, but in practice was only used to a limited degree. The Prussians had the most effective system, one in which a conscript would serve for a few years for being sent back home, at which time they would only be summoned for duties for a few weeks per year at times of peace, not unlike the modern U.S. Army Reserves. This system was copied by the Austrians, in other countries, conscription was mainly used as a method of dealing with the outcasts and undesirable elements of society. You know, petty criminals, village idiots, people like me, other outcasts, were pressed into service through such means. Given the nature of military service, it should be no surprise that desertion was endemic in armies and wars, of this time. Frederick the Great viewed desertion as being almost as much of a threat to an army when campaigning as the enemy itself. These guys are not being paid well. They're being treated very poorly. Uh, they're dying in droves. Uh, they're off in camps where disease is rampant. And they don't have a lot of good reasons to be there. Yeah. Now, soldiers in light infantry units were often recruited from areas seen as creating men more suited for the role due to cultural or geographical reasons. The Austrians, for example, found that Serbians and Croatians often excelled in the role. Now, high-ranking officers typically came from the nobility, while lower-ranking positions and non-commissioned officers were open to commoners. It's worth noting that a degree of meritocracy existed in almost every major army. Commoners did on occasion become officers, though typically only if their candidacy was supported by a nobleman. Sometimes they would even be ennobled as a result of such promotions. The Austrian Field Marshal Karl Mack von Liebrich was born as a commoner, for example. 
But it is true that there is, like, a lot of fuckery still yeah. going on. It, it's hard to make arms. your way up. I mean, Carl Mack basically does because, like, he just knows all the right people and, like, everybody really liked him. I mean, and by everybody, I mean a nobleman really liked him. Uh, it's like commoners can become officers. It does happen. There are people who be like, oh, that never happened until the French Revolution. No, it did. It just wasn't super common. Yes. And this is a very, still a very class based military system in general. So, backing up infantry, you have cavalry, you know, the pretty boys on the horses. The importance of cavalry has declined at this point in history since its heyday in the Middle Ages, yet cavalry still remains an important arm of any military. Cavalry men are typically armed with a variety of weapons at this time. You have carbines and pistols being used for range combat, while sabers and other kinds of one-handed swords were the most common weapons for melee on melee action uh, if you think that a bunch of dudes standing still with a musket are inaccurate, uh, try comparing that to a dude with a flintlock pistol uh, riding on the back of a stallion. Oh, yeah. And, and one of like the kind of weird things in military history, um, you know, when we think of military history, we think like gunpowder weapons become, you know, a thing, and then everybody just switches to them. We kind nope. of have a reverse with cavalry, where if you look at cavalry in the 1500s and 1600s, there is a, especially by 1600s, they almost all switch to just using guns primarily. You know, they'll they ride up, fire off their pistols, and then like wheel away to go and reload. By the Napoleonic period and a bit before, they go back to really relying on the saber as their primary weapon. Folks are using sabers all the way up to the American Civil War. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Yeah, so it's like that was, you know, very effective even when guns were commonplace. You basically cannot ride and aim at the same time unless you are in a John Wayne movie. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So the use of cavalry is down basically to the speed of having people on horseback, okay? They performed a number of vital functions for armies of the era. The eyes of the army, capable of scouting out far ahead from the main body and putting visuals on enemy forces. They're useful in harassing the enemy, launching raids, attacking supply carriages, creating ambush, disrupting those lines. In battle, they are used to outflank enemy forces and run down retreating men. Indeed, a good cavalry charge launched when the enemy was near the point of breaking could turn a retreat into a bloody rout. Cavalry would thus play an indispensable role in destroying defeated armies. Jay, cavalry strike me as a, a big test for the commander of the battlefield. Like, they strike me as very easily to use properly and also easily to use improperly. Like, oh, yeah. if you push them in at the, at the right time, they can completely, they, they can do massive damage and completely uh, turn the tide and, and uh, multiply your, your slight win into a massive victory. Or you could, like, completely waste them, get them all killed, they're very expensive to replace, whatnot. Yeah, I mean, the, the famous Charge of the Light Brigade in the Crimean War is basically just down to a British general messing up orders and sending his cavalry to charge into a fortified Russian position, and they all basically, you know, die or get mauled pretty heavily. So they're very much kind of glass cannony. It's uh, very easy to lose a lot of them, and it's very easy to also use them, or not very easy, but, but when used well, they can, you know, change the battle. Now, in terms of recruitment, you know, cavalry was a far more respectable job than that of a common foot soldier, and thus cavalrymen were typically recruited from the nobility. And the pay provided by the job was often appealing to the lower-ranking aristocrats as well as, you know, the second or third sons of nobles. Um, we talked a little bit about this on our previous episodes on the revolution. A lot of nobles don't actually have much money, 
So the cavalry, you know, serving in the cavalry is a way for a lot of these guys to earn a living. That's still kind of respectable. But the aristocracy alone was often not enough to fill the ranks of the cavalry, and as such, non-nobles were recruited as well, typically those from wealthier backgrounds and, you know, who would end up as common soldiers. Certain cavalry units were also drawn from ethnicities that had a long history of horsemanship, such as the famous Russian Cossacks and Hungarian Hussars. Now, the third section of the army was the artillery. Artillery in the 1790s was in the midst of a transformation that would see it evolve from just being a kind of useful tool to being known as the queen of the battlefield. 18th century artillery consisted primarily of bronze, smoothbore, muzzle-loading cannons, firing solid iron shots at medium and long ranges, and canister shot at short ranges. Th these things operate more or less by the same principles as the muskets we already talked about. It's just a really big bronze musket. Now, the process of standardization at the time meant that by the start of the Revolutionary Wars, most countries employed a system of 4-pound, 8-pounder, and 12-pounder cannons for field battles. Larger cannons, as well as more exotic weapons such as howitzers, mortars, rockets, yada yada, were typically reserved for siege warfare. The French had the best artillery going in the conflict, thanks to the... Ribouval system, adopted in 1765. Not only were cannons standardized, but all of their supporting equipment, the carriages, the tools, the wheels, and whatnot, were made to be uniform as possible, and better sighting systems were implemented to allow for more precision firing. Now, the main division between field guns was that between horse and foot artillery. With foot artillery, the cannons were towed by horses, but their crews marched alongside on foot. With horse artillery, on the other hand, the crews would also be mounted on their own horses. Horse artillery is naturally the more flexible of the two, but also the more expensive. The concentration of cannons into large batteries, as opposed to just having them distributed throughout an army, would become one of the defining tactics of these wars, and one most thoroughly employed by the French. Now, the role of an artillery officer was also less glamorous than that of a cavalry officer, but artillery required skill and knowledge to be employed effectively. The result is that across Europe, artillery tended to be the most meritocratic of the three main sections. Artillery officers typically attended the new military universities being established by governments and were expected to have a good degree of knowledge in mathematics, geography, and engineering. Both aristocrats and commoners alike were readily recruited. Yeah, you know, anybody can ride a horse, swing a sword, tell people when to shoot. Artillery involves, like, math. You gotta, like, break out your protractor and shit. Possibly while being shot at. So, that's military? That's the military. Okay, into the war itself. We went over a lot of the early information in our last episode, but we'll do a recap just to start us off cleanly. We begin in the year of 1792. The War of the First Coalition would be fought on several fronts. You have three primary fronts that open up at the beginning, which is the Northern Front, centered around modern-day Belgium, the Rhine Front, which is along France's border with the German states of the Holy Roman Empire, and the Italian Front, centered in Northern Italy. Quick reminder, during this entire period, Italy, as well as Germany, is not a unified place at this point. There's tons of little states in there. You know, the Catholic Church still controls a massive amount of territory. It's not united. So Italy is a region in this episode, not a, a country or a belligerent. 
Starting up with the northern front, France's war began with an invasion of Belgium on April the 21st. They're trying to take it from the Austrians. The French were hoping for a quick, decisive victory, and many Girondins expected that their armies would be greeted as liberators by the people of Europe. In reality, however, the French army was in a precarious situation. Large-scale desertion of primarily aristocratic officers led to a dearth in leadership and a breakdown of morale, discipline, and logistics. For more on this, again, listen to the last episode. Measures were also put in place to encourage recruitment, such as lowering the length and minimum age for service and allowing passive citizens into the National Guard. Again, if you want to know what a passive citizen is, listen to the last episode. But the effects of such efforts would not be seen for several months. Jay, in my research, I actually found out that there's a funny thing about like the people of Belgium is that the French you know, thought they would be welcomed as, as liberators, you know, liberating them from the Austrians. But the Belgians just a few years ago had like kind of fought up quasi revolution, a bit of some battles with the Austrians because the Austrians were trying to take away their, their Catholic religion yes. fully and whatnot. <laughs> yeah. And that's also what the French are planning to do. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Emperor Joseph the Second was like kind of trying to do it all just like the French Revolution stuff before the French Revolution, and people did not like it. <laughs> yeah, so the Belgians had already done their revolution on the side of conservatism. Yes. Which does happen, we often forget. The poor state of the French army was revealed as soon as the invasion of Belgium began, and it stalls out pretty much immediately. Battles such as Marquin and Kivoren, the French were repulsed by the Austrian forces, often being sent into rout after a f just a few rounds of cannon fire. The French general at Marquin, Theobald Delon, was executed by his own men for supposed treason, the start of a pattern that would become increasingly more common and formalized in the coming years. Remember, in this revolutionary period, uh... You're running on propaganda logic, okay? The French army is superior and smarter and better and cooler and has bigger dicks than every other army, so they can't lose. And they can't lose because the officers are incompetent, because if the officers are incompetent, then why did you uh, put them in charge, comrade? So instead it's like, oh no, the officers like lost intentionally or being bribed and they have committed treason is the logic we're going to see a lot of. Yeah, very much so. Now, while the French bashed themselves against Austrian garrisons in the north, their enemies were amassing an army on the eastern bank of the Rhine River under the command of the Prussian Duke of Brunswick. In July, Brunswick issued the infamous Brunswick Manifesto, threatening the destruction of Paris if the king was harmed. And in August, the Prussians began their invasion of France. The fortifications of Longwy and Verdun fell by the 2nd of September, opening a route directly to the French capital. Side note, Brunswick would, like, issue, you know, his, like, waggling his finger now. If you touch Louis, there's going to be a serious problem here, okay? And, you know, cue the DJ Khaled gif. You played yourself because that, like, immediately makes an angry mob uh, arrest Louis it, for him being a collaborator with the Austrians. Which, to be fair, he was. But, like... Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Louis probably would have died at, at some point in this, in this sequence of events. At, at, during the summer of, of, of 92, that was, like, increasingly likely, but I don't know. Duke of Brunswick probably, you know, sped it up by a few weeks at least. <laughs> yeah. Now, at this point, we have a little bit of what can be determined, called, you know, a, a bit of a miracle for the French. You know, they're facing a very grim situation going to the fall of 1792, but few would have predicted the dramatic reversal that was about to occur. On the 20th of September, the French army, under the command of generals Dumouriez and Kellerman, faced the Prussians at Valmy. 
The French had managed to maneuver to Brunswick's rear and set a position on a ridge. Uh, this battle can be described as the most important non-battle in history. You know, the coalition army retreated after basically just a brief engagement. You know, they fired off a couple rounds, they did a little bit of cannon fire, and, and they left. Yeah, my understanding was that troops didn't even engage each other. It was just yeah. pure cannon fire, and it was, like, raining. Yeah, like, the Prussians, like... like the Prussians begin to march, like, to engage, and then, like, Brunswick just, like, calls them off halfway. Which was, like, probably at the time, like, not an incorrect tactical decision. Oh, uh, certainly not. Like, Brunswick, you know, he will kind of fail hard throughout the Revolutionary and Napoleonic Wars. Um, He's not a stupid person. He's just a person who's very much stuck in, like, the older, like, seven years war way of warfare, where it's, like, you have, like, a smaller army. You don't want to waste it because it's expensive. Like, we're not in a good situation. Even though we outnumber them, we're, you know, going to retreat, going to conserve my forces, wait for it to, like, not be raining or whatever. And, yeah, so, like, Brunswick, like, we just expected to resume his offensive in good time. But events elsewhere along the fronts would soon make that impossible. Yeah, you have this situation like three months, four months into the war where Brunswick is is poised to capture Paris if he like wins one more battle. And no one's going to get that close to doing that for another what 22 years yeah <laughs> like the like this is going to be the high water mark <laughs> for the non-french for a very long time and it's turned around by like two hours of cannon fire and a rainstorm yep so just as du maurier and brunswick were maneuvering in the mud around valmy Another French army, under the command of General Custina, had begun a campaign across the Rhine in Germany. Again, Germany is a region, not a country. The small German states of that region were ill-prepared for war. These are not the big boys of Austria and Prussia. They have much smaller armies and just, you know, you know can't get it up easily. By October, the French had captured Speyer, Worms, Mainz, and Frankfurt, and Brunswick was forced to abandon his gains in France and march back into Germany to deal with that threat, you know, before he gets cut off. You don't, you, you don't want your, the enemy army between you and the motherland. That's, that does not go well. Yeah. So basically, kind of the the junior members of the coalition fuck up, and Daddy Brunswick's gotta gotta come and bail them out. Volmy and the Rhine campaigns had effectively granted the revolution a stay of execution, a stay they would not be granting other people. But don't crash. <laughs> Paris was saved, and the morale of both soldiers and civilians began to improve. In the south, the Italian front had also opened strongly, with the French seizing Savoy and Nice from the Kingdom of Sardinia after that nation had joined the coalition against France. Did Sardinia just say, you know, let's get in on the pile on, and then yeah, pretty just, much. Uh, just <laughs> immediately goes poorly for them? Yeah. I was surprised that they, that, that they ended up fighting in Italy at all. Like, when I was, like, reading the, the first thing, it's like, I knew this was, like, Austria and Prussia against France, and then, like, I hear all, most of the famous battles are in Italy, and I'm like, why the fuck are they in Italy? Oh, yeah, there'll be a, there'll be a lot of fighting in Italy, especially later on. But, yeah, Sardinia was very much, I think, just in it to try to, try to get some land off of, off of the French. Which, I mean, to be fair, in August of 92, looked like a really good yeah. idea. <laughs> yeah. Moving back up north, the situation would further improve for France in November of 92. The French army under Maurier began another invasion of Belgium, culminating in the Battle of Jemap on November 6th. The French army defeated a significantly outnumbered Austrian force and overran the country, capturing Antwerp by December uh, in 
his uh, Revolutions podcast, Mike Duncan points out he's he's kind of like trying to tamper down that idea of the superior, uh, you know, f- f- uh, French army, and he's like, yeah, they won, but like they had a massive numerical advantage. So yeah. Oh yeah, Jamap was very hard fought battle for the French, despite their numerical advantage. It was. It was not easy. But they did get, as the man who killed uh, John F. Kennedy would call it, the big mo. You know, they got the momentum. Indeed. Uh, and, and, you know, by the end of 1792, France thus found herself in what looked to be a near unassailable position of strength. Her armies had advanced on all fronts. The Girondin rhetoric of bold French citizen soldiers overcoming the slave soldiers of their enemies through Elan alone was becoming a reality. Yet this attitude would turn out to be one of overconfidence. As noted by Marshal saint one of the most brilliant military leaders of the Revolutionary and Napoleonic Wars, quote, an irrational pride and self-confidence had taken the government in its grip, and had come to believe that it could topple each and every throne with mere decrees. The foundations of these conquests would prove to be weak in the coming year. Yeah, you see this, like, a lot in revolutions. You can kind of understand the logic in it. Like, once governments start being toppled and systems of society that have been in place for 500 years are cu- are suddenly gone, it kind of feels like anything can happen and that we're, like, really cool because we're doing these really cool things. And, you know, that all crumbles to the reality that, like, you're still men who have to fight with logistics and discipline and all of the shit. Like, just because you did one exceptional thing doesn't mean the rules of logic no longer apply to you. Yeah, very much so. And yet people keep making the mistake <laughs> over and over and over and over because no one is competent. Yeah. Now, moving on to uh, 1793, you know, the winter of late 1792 and into early 93 took a severe toll on the French army. Short on supplies and equipment, morale began to suffer once more as the government in Paris ordered multiple offensives throughout the winter months. Discipline was poor as many of the newly promoted and elected officers were unable to enforce their will on soldiers who increasingly viewed any undesirable duty or command as counter-revolutionary. You know, how do you get out of, you know, digging a ditch? You know, you just say that, you know, that's (laughs) counter-revolutionary. On January 31st, the French expanded the conflict even further with another declaration of war, this time on Britain and the Netherlands, where with Spain would then be declared a little over a month later. And they're declaring war on Britain because, like, they they, they want the Netherlands. Like, the British... The British don't, like, control the Netherlands, but they have, like, a very tight, like, relationship. Yes. It's, it's, like, sphere of influence shit. Uh, And and the French are just like, yeah, we we, we can take that. How hard could it be? Yeah. But I I thought Spain declared war on them Yeah, so that was actually a bit of a mistake. Because Spain invades. It was a bit of a mistake I made in the previous episode that said Spain declared war. France actually declared war first, but Spain took the first action. I've not really been able to find, you know, good reason for why France declared war on Spain. I guess they were just high off of, you know, all their victories. And they're like, it, it's easy. And they, and they were kind of worried that Spain was going to invade, uh, which Spain did end up doing. But yeah, France technically declares war first again. <laughs> I mean, you know, you're at war with everyone else on every other side of you besides the Atlantic Ocean. Why not make it a clean sweep? You know, (laughs) why why not? (laughs) Yeah. So moving back once again to the northern front of the Netherlands and Belgium, the large-scale fighting in 93 kicked off with a push from De Maurier into the Netherlands. De Maurier, however, had deeply overestimated the security of French control over Belgium and underestimated the strength of his enemies. The Austrians, now led by the Prince of Saxe, Coburg Salfeld, I don't care how that's actually pronounced, who was a veteran of the Turkish War, 
began his own offensive against the French, winning victories at Liege, Aachen, and lifting the French siege of Maastricht before inflicting a decisive blow on the French at Neerwinden on March 18th. Faced with defeat, de Maurier, the hero of 1792, attempted to plot a coup against the government and then defected to the Austrians. De Maurier is a weird character. Like, I, I kind of want to, like, read a book on him. Like, like he, you know, because there's so much going on in yeah. all of this. Like, there's too much going on. Like, I'm sure a lot of people who are covering this war don't even mention that de Maurier exists. But, like, he's a very accomplished guy. He did a lot of shit. My understanding is that he, he did a lot of things that he didn't think was a good idea, but he was being ordered to do it. So he's like, fine, yes. fuck it. Um, you, you can... Yeah, I don't agree with his politics, but you you can understand why he was not fan of uh, a fan of the French politicians back home. Uh, the weird thing is that he was the, he, he basically was not able to get support from enough other officers to make his coup successful. Um, I, I don't know. He just strikes me as like a weird guy, and I kind of want to know more about him. But we are in far too complicated a story to give de Maurier any attention like I feel like if this was this any other time in history there would be like historical dramas and movies about this guy and like his inner conflict yeah. and like was he a hero or a traitor but in the mess that is the war of the French coalition he is like a footnote The French were subsequently forced out of the Low Countries, that includes Belgium, and now all of their gains of the previous year have been erased, and on top of that, British troops have begun to arrive on land, joining their Austrian allies and strengthening the previously undermanned coalition force in the north. And meanwhile, the war in Germany was following a similar course. The arrival of Brunswick's army forced the French to abandon their conquest and retreat back across the Rhine. At Mainz, a revolutionary government that had been installed by the French was shelved into submission by coalition artillery. On the 23rd of March, the Holy Roman Empire formally declared war on France, and the coalition was soon joined by Portugal, Naples, and Tuscany. Spanish troops crossed the Pyrenees, and Britain began to impose a naval blockade on the fledgling French Republic. The French jubilation of late 1792 had almost completely evaporated. You know, this is kind of a weird series of episodes for us, because you know, the coalition's going to lose this war, and usually we tell the story from the side of the loser. You know, this is no one is competent, right? Yeah. We're kind of telling this from the French perspective this time because we also wanted to cover the incompetency of French leadership and that's going down the French Revolution. And most people want to know the French side of this because this is the French Revolution. It's objectively the more historically important event. But if you're kind of looking this from the coalition's point of view, let's sort of flip it around. You know, 92, we came close, but there were some fucky wuckies. We had to tamp stuff down. But now we're sort of slowly pushing the French back. The coalition is growing stronger every month. We've got more and more allies. We're surrounding France from all sides. What could go wrong? Oh, yeah. Like, yeah, it, it's looking good for the coalition in, in you know, first half of 1793. How could you possibly fuck <laughs> this up? Yeah. You know, no, it, seriously. Like, like, you could just... <laughs> You could just blockade the entire country, just slowly invade it. How do you possibly this is one of those, this like, up? This is one of those wars where, like, if it didn't happen and somebody, like, proposed this as, like, an alternate history, people would be like, no, this you, the, you're dumb. France is not going to win. Like, this is stupid. <laughs> They're literally <laughs> being attacked from every single direction. <laughs> yeah. And their position in 1793 was made even more precarious by the outbreak of rebellion at home. Towns and cities, primarily in central and southern France, rose up in the so-called Federalist revolts, led by moderate Republicans and monarchists. Lyon, Marseille, Nantes, Rouen, and Toulon all joined the rebellion. 
These primarily urban uprisings coincided with rural uprisings in western France, most notably in the imp impoverished Vendée region, where conservative anti-revolutionary sentiment was strong. You know, bands of rebels seized weapons, killed officials and soldiers, and overthrew local governments. Once again, if you want to know why many of the peoples of France are rising up against a new revolutionary government, listen to the last episode. The need to combat these uprisings, in turn, weakened France's effort against the coalition. It's kind of hard to fight a civil war and a war war at the same time. For example, the withdrawal of troops to suppress the uprising in Lyon led to Sardinia retaking Savoy and Nice. The French began their suppression of the Federalists by midsummer, recapturing several towns and cities and inflicting brutal reprisals on their civilian populations. This, in turn, caused the rebels in Toulon, France's most important naval port on the Mediterranean, to invite a British squadron to come on down and take over the city under the command of Samuel Hood. And now, without firing a single shot, the coalition has 17,000 soldiers occupying a key French city. Good job. Now, the coalition thus entered the latter half of 1793 in a significant position of strength. If there was ever a time in which the French Revolution could have been snuffed out, you know, besides right before Valmy, this is probably it. Yeah, and the, the French government at this time is like brand spanking new because the radical Jacobins have just taken over the Committee of Public Safety and their control of the country is extremely tenuous and they are mostly very unpopular. Yeah. But of course, the revolution would be saved in large part due to the mistakes of the coalition leaders. Now, one of the few advantages possessed by France was a series of fortifications dating back to the reign of Louis XIV that protected her eastern borders. When properly manned, these proved difficult to overcome. But by July, the Austrian army of saxe coburg had managed to punch a hole in the defenses and open up a route to the French heartland. France was only saved from potential disaster by the conflicting interests of the members of the coalition. The British, whose forces now made up a significant portion of the coalition army the north, insisted on laying siege to Dunkirk instead of pushing onwards into France. The Austrians acquiesced and just set about occupying themselves by laying siege to other French forts. This would afford France the breathing space they needed to put down these revolts. Now, for those of us not watching this on YouTube where there's going to be some handy visuals, let me just help you picture this in your mind's eye. So France is, is like Ohio. It's like pretty flat. There's, you know, there's hills and there there's valleys and whatnot. But like there's only mountains on one side of it. it once you get into the country, it's pretty easy to like go anywhere with your army. So, in order to defend it, you need to, like, create more, more barriers. That's what this line of forts is doing. And so, you know, they punch through that barrier, they can go right to the heart. But, what Britain wants, I believe because the Prime Minister of Britain at the time wants to take Dunkirk as, like, basically, shall we say, um the prize for winning the war. Yeah. And Dunkirk is famously this city in northern France. So you have the eastern border of France being penetrated, but then the coalition wants to shift the focus to the north. So once the coalition has punched this hole in this line of forts on the eastern border, which is quite the accomplishment, I may say, instead of, like, going through that hole and attacking directly the French heartland, they instead, like, kind of keep going up that line, taking those forts, which I'm sure was, like, you know, difficult and time-consuming, and, you know, once you have a fort, you kind of want to, like, hunker down and keep it. And I imagine that's going to waste a lot of precious time. Yeah, it does. <laughs> 
So by September of 93, the French were able to concentrate enough forces in the north to go on the offensive once again. A French army of 40,000 men defeated a British force of 20,000 at Hanschkut, and in the following month, an even larger army under Jean-Baptiste Jodon turned back the Austrians at Vatinese, forcing them to abandon their siege of Mobu. I have no idea how any of these words are pronounced. <laughs> Poor coordination between the Austrians and their Prussian allies in Germany, meanwhile led to a series of French victories along the Rhine, securing that front for the time being. Now, no discussion of the French Revolutionary Wars would be complete without the mention of the famous Levee en Masse, which is a decree issued by the National Convention in August of 93 that authorized the conscription of all unmarried, able-bodied men between the age of 18 and 25, and called for the complete participation of French society in the war effort. Young men were conscripted, women and older married men were put to work making war material, horses were requisitioned, buildings were turned over to the army, etc., etc. Now, the effects of levy on mass would not be felt in 1793. It would take months at minimum for new forces to be raised, but the policy would prove vital in the war effort uh, for the coming years. Now, there are some misconceptions with these wars in general. They're often categorized as you know, kind of just like a French Zerg rush where they just like, they do why they have mass and now they have a massive army and like they instantly steamroll everyone. Yeah, I've seen a lot of people pitch this as like, oh, the French in their revolutionary genius were the first European country to allow poor people to fight and they no. just <laughs> signed all the poor people up and they used those numbers to crush all of the European states. And this is kind of like used as an easy explanation for why France defeats, le like, all these other nations when, like, they're very clearly, like, outnumbered. -ish. Yeah, like, it, it, it's very funny when people say that because, like, as we mentioned earlier, most soldiers come from pretty poor backgrounds. Middle-class people did not volunteer to be, you know, redcoats. Soldiers were generally, you know, they were professionals. I think people see the word professional and they think, like, you know, that means, like, they're more elite or, like, they're better. Um, soldiers came from bad backgrounds in this period, by and large. And on the topic of numbers, you know, one, you had really large armies in previous wars, most notably the Seven Years War. It's not like these armies will be unnaturally massive. They will start becoming really big once we start getting to the Napoleonic period. But like these armies aren't way bigger than what had been seen previously. And Throughout this war, there will often be battles where, like, more often than not, the French don't have overwhelming numerical superiority. We've mentioned a couple of battles already where they did, but that's not the norm. A lot of the battles will be, like, 30,000 men on one side and 28,000 men on the other or something like that. Um, really, where Levé and Mass comes into play is that it allows the French to operate in multiple theaters just because they have, like, really good reserves. Um, and we'll talk a little bit about the organization, which is arguably more important uh, later on. I mean, they even like stop conscription like in, in 98 because like they don't need it anymore. Um, so it, 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 it helps a lot, but it's not like, oh, instant, you know, massive army. Now we just roll over everyone. Glad we, we kind of got that tucked away uh, for the, for the record. So if 92 was a year of jubilation for France's armies, 93 was one of consolidation, and this was most famously exemplified by the Siege of Toulon. As all the other Federalist cities had fallen, Toulon held out, guarded by those thousands of coalition soldiers we mentioned earlier. The fate of the city was sealed on the 18th of December when a French force led a young artillery officer by the name of, I don't know how, how you pronounce this, uh, Na Na Napoleon Bonaparte, uh, who captured a fort overlooking the harbor. The British, prioritizing the safety of their fleet over their hold on the city, embarked the coalition army and abandoned the people of Toulon to their fate, which was very nasty. While Toulon was a victory for France, the British did manage to sink nine French ships and capture an additional 16 on their way out. 
severely reducing the French naval strength in the Mediterranean, which will have consequences for decades to come. 1793, in general, was a year of severe trial for France. She left it with less territory than she possessed the year before, but was in an arguably stronger position, with the home front secured by the force of arms and her armies beaten back from their greatest positions of strength. We, we don't go that far into, like, the French Civil War, shall we say? Like, it, it's, it's kind of anticlimactic, because... You know, you have massive parts of the country revolting, like, what feels like all of a sudden, um, and then it, it's put down relatively quickly, at least on this timeline. It, it is wor should be worth noting that, like, there's still fighting going on in Vendée, like, as, as yeah. late as, like, 94, but it, it's not organized, it's very sporadic, it's mostly just, like, peasants doing kind of uh, rural guerrilla combat it's 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 an annoyance rather than a proper theater of the war and in general those armies were never able to organize and work together in a way that would make them a serious threat to the central french government yeah indeed now as france entered 1794 she did so with an army that was rapidly growing in strength thanks to both levy en masse and the reforms of lazare carnot the minister of war and a member of the committee of public safety a military engineer by education carnot would prove to be highly skilled at transforming the french army into arguably the strongest in all of europe now the effects of conscription meant that by the end of this year france had over 800,000 men in the field compared to just 430,000 men for the coalition. This numerical superiority allowed for the French to maintain a high tempo of operations on multiple fronts at the same time. Yeah, and this is like political technology, right? Yeah. Like, they're taking advantage of their people to such a degree that even though they are one country against, like, seven, they have a larger fighting force. Yeah. Carnot also improved the administration and structure of the army. The revolutionary practice of electing officers was eliminated, because it turns out that really never goes well. <laughs> and units received more formal, strict training to improve their effectiveness. The myriad of volunteer battalions that had cropped up during the previous years were reorganized and consolidated into permanent units attached to the regular army. The army as a whole was restructured along the lines of divisions, a concept that had its origins in the latter years of the Ancien Regime. Now, you know, previously individual units of infantry, cavalry, and artillery were basically administered separately and kind of just merged into ad hoc armies during a war. Like, you would have, like, you know, an infantry battalion and a cavalry company and be like, oh, like, you're together now for this operation, but, like, that's it. Uh, but, you know, with these divisions, these would be permanent combined armed units, meaning that each division will have infantry, cavalry, and artillery under the same leadership. They're basically miniature armies in and of themselves. And this system should seem familiar because it's what's still used to this very day by pretty much every modern military. One of the most overlooked events of the war is the events that transpired in Corsica in 1794. If you don't know, this is a island owned by the French in the Mediterranean off the uh, French coast. It's kind of off the five o'clock of France, and it is the uh, homeland of a very special boy we'll be talking about in a bit. Basically, what's going to happen is that an entire French department go is going to go over th to the coalition with barely a shot fired. Now, at a younger age, the Corsican leader, uh, Pascal Pal How do you pronounce this name, Jay? It's uh, pa pa Pasquale Pal uh, yeah. uh, Pasquale Pauli is one I've heard. Pasquale Pal. That's just nasty in the mouth. Let's call him Polly. I'm going to call him Paul. So, so Polly boy here is one of the most famous men in Western Europe. He's a fierce advocate of Corsican independence, and he'd fought a prolonged guerrilla campaign against first Genoa and now France. 
He's eventually defeated by the French, but allowed to return to the island and resume his political career after the start of the revolution. Now in charge of Corsica once more, he sought to secure its independence by seceding from France and becoming a protectorate of Britain. The British duly accepted his invitation and sent their forces to the island, further increasing their naval dominance of the Mediterranean. So this is a major loss for France in 74 as they are going to lose control of Corsica. Yeah. Yeah, Pauli is the kind of interesting guy. He was sort of like the Enlightenment Che Guevara, and that like he's like this famous revolutionary um, who kind of just gets forgotten by history. Like, you know, people at the time would be very surprised that like nobody today knows about Pauli. Like he's very important to the story of a guy who we'll be talking about much more in, you know, many future episodes, that being Napoleon. Because Napoleon's dad will work for Pauli, you know, in his little guerrilla army. And Napoleon will grow up hearing stories of Pauli, you know, fighting in the woods for, for Corsican independence. And is like a huge worshiper of Pauli. And kind of has like a, you know, like a never meet your heroes moment where like once Napoleon gets started in politics and Pauli's back, they kind of become political foes. And eventually when Pauli kind of like, you know, like switches sides... Napoleon kind of has to, like, rush his family out of Corsica into France because, you know, Napoleon is from Corsica. So, yeah, Pauli is kind of an interesting guy. That's why I feel like he's worth mentioning. Um, people want to look him up further, I do recommend it. Elsewhere, though, the war would go much better for France in 1794. Along their southern borders, the French pushed the Spanish back across the Pyrenees and captured Savoy and Nice once again from Sardinia. The Rhine front, on the other hand, would remain basically stable for the duration of the year. You know, there are some battles, but they're mostly kind of indecisive. Now, 1794 would see an intensification of the war at sea. You know, faced with continued grain shortages, remember that's kind of the thing that started the revolution, and with British ships preying upon their merchant vessels, the French decided to concentrate all the grain they could gather from their colonies in the New World as well as additional grain purchased from the United States, all in this like big merchant fleet in Hampton Roads, Virginia, which would then be escorted across the Atlantic by a powerful French naval force. Now, secrecy was virtually impossible for such a large operation, which meant that the British were alerted to the French convoy and began searching for it in due time. Eventually, a Royal Navy fleet under Lord Howe intercepted the French convoy on June 1st, leading to an engagement that would hence be known, rather conveniently, as the Glorious First of June. The First of June was a very confused battle, with fighting between two roughly equal fleets. The British had 25 ships of the line, whereas the French had 26, uh, you know, quickly dissolved into a disorganized melee. By the end of the battle, the British had sunk one French ship and captured an additional six while losing none of their own, but the French grain convoy was able to give them the slip and reach France, which would lead to both sides claiming victory. This is kind of like a funny battle where, again, like both sides proclaim victory. You know, the press in both countries talks that up as like a great win. But like in both countries, the actual admiralty and government is pretty furious because their naval captains don't cover themselves in glory during this engagement. A lot of the British captains like disobey orders, just fuck up, you know, they try doing fancy maneuvers and just fail kind of hard. On the French side, like they just a lot of like their their very powerful ships like just fight very poorly. So it goes down in history as the glorious first of June, but a lot of actual people in both navies don't remember it that way. Now the most famous battle in ninety four would be fought not at sea but on land, once again in the fields of Belgium. Remember, France is not in control of Belgium at this point. In May of 94, the French decided to concentrate their forces from the armies of the Ardennes, North, and Moselle into a single large force of 96,000 men under the command of General Jean-Baptiste Jourdan. A veteran of the American Revolution, Jourdan himself proved to be an able commander during 93, most notably by defeating the Austrians at Vatnez. For his victory, Jourdan had received the reward of having much of the credit stolen from him by Lazar Carnot, 
which Jay is still salty about. <laughs> but in January of 94, Jordan was even arrested by the Order of Carnot and brought before the Committee of Public Safety. Um, only with eyewitness testimony by a rep representative on mission saving him from being guillotined. I believe also Robespierre actually advocated for Jourdan, if I remember correctly. That might be, yeah, that sounds like it might be possible. I, I don't think Robespierre had any beef with him. Carnot is like an interesting guy where like he's really good at organizing and raising and like making an army, but his tactical decisions suck. And, like, he tries interfering and, like, giving orders to, to Jordan, and Jordan's like, no. And that's basically why Jordan ends up on trial. <laughs> yeah, he's he, he's a pencil pusher. He's yeah. uh, the spreadsheet guy. You know, is, that's is what he's good at. You know, he's virgin and shad and all that. 64% of history is just virgin and shad <laughs> memes, okay? This is all the way down. After briefly being forced out of the army, you know, what with the whole almost being killed thing, Jourdan is back in command just four months later. Such was the tumultuous nature of French command during the Revolutionary War. We're, we're cutting out a lot of minutia here, but, like, France has executed dozens of its officers at this yeah. point uh, for, for failure. And, like, one of the just like hard to grasp things about this war in this period is like how fast things ha go. It's like, that's why I included this where it's like this guy like wins a big victory in like November, or like October. Or so that he's on trial in January, kicked out of the army. And then he's back in command, like a few months later of like one of the largest armies France has. And like, you know, when you talk about, like, the Federalist Revolt, so you have, like, a city go up in rebellion in, like, June and then be reoccupied in, like, July. It's, like, events happen fast during this this whole uh, time period. You you can really understand why most historians give this war a wide berth because it's really not a single cohesive narrative. It's, like, a bunch of micro-episodes, yeah. including, like the fate of Corsican independence yeah. just sort of hanging out there, which no one gives a shit about. Also, including one of the funniest historical events, which we will mention later is going to go down in this war, that no one knows or has ever mentioned. Yeah, like, and like, another, like we don't mention the script, but, like, the revolution in Haiti happens during this war. <laughs> like, yes! there's a lot of, like, weird yes! stuff to happen. During this war. The most revolutionary thing happening right now is at, is going on on the other side of the world. Yeah, like, I, I do think we probably will talk about that eventually in some other episode. Oh, 100%. But, yeah. <laughs> 100%. I, I actually know a decent amount about the Haitian Revolution. We will, we will cover it. But we're just pointing this out to make it clear how chaotic this period is. But anyway, Jordan is back in command. And he's tasked by the French government with crossing the river Sambra and laying siege to the Austrians and Dutch at the fort of Charleroi in Belgium. Now, three previous French attacks had been launched against Charleroi, and all three had failed. Jordan's first attempt was similarly beaten back by the coalition. Following that battle, the Dutch Prince of Orange, because... Wyatt, you cannot say that word on the podcast. Uh, anyway, uh, the, the, Dutch French, the, the Dutch Prince of Orange dispersed his forces to defend other areas. You know, he's assuming that there's no way the French are going to try and attack this fort a fifth time. We already beat them four times. They're, they're not going to do that. That would be crazy. Only stupid people being ordered around by a, uh, I don't know, um, increasingly insane committee of public safety who is executing even his closest political allies uh, would do. But, you know, Jordan uh, knows he's on thin ice with the folks back home because, again, he almost just got executed earlier this year and he's going to take this damn fort. Because otherwise, he's going to die. So, he amasses his forces for a fifth attack. 
A request by the Austrian commander for British reinforcements was turned down by the British, who thought the Austrians were attempting to use them to cover for their own retreat. And as a result, the Battle of Fleurs would see a French army of 82,000 men face off against 52,000 coalition soldiers. Even though the coalition had more forces they could have used in the area. The subsequent coalition defeat would lead to Austria abandoning Belgium altogether, effectively ceding it to France as the British pulled back to the Netherlands, which they wanted to defend. You know, the British, they're interested in defending the Netherlands, but the Austrians are interested in defending Belgium, and it just doesn't work out well. Yeah. This is kind of part of the, uh, shall we say, counterintuitive nature of this war, where, like, you're like, how could France possibly win? They're up against all of these opponents at once. Yeah. And all of those opponents don't necessarily like each other or communicate well or plan or coordinate or take each other seriously or back each other up or want to make sacrifices for each other. Now, the battle for us is also notable in the history of war as featuring the first use of manned aircraft in warfare. The newly formed French Aerostatic Corps floated a gas-filled, tethered observation balloon above the battle in an attempt to observe enemy formations. The intelligence provided by the balloon was not really that useful. You know, the future Mar- Marshal Soult would later claim that, quote, this ridiculous innovation would not even deserve to be mentioned if it had been made out to be something important, and he would even describe its use as plain embarrassing. But nonetheless, paintings of this battle frequently depict a balloon floating above the melee. French victory at Fleurus and the subsequent Austrian retreat would also have a significant political impact on the revolution, as it lessened the sense of desperate you know, emergency that had been used to justify the reign of terror. One of the things we talked about last time is that what part of what made the terror so horrible is that it continued to happen after people pointed out that there was no longer a foreign pressure that was forcing the country to go into mean lean times yeah uh the 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 excesses of the terror continued even after they were not quote-unquote necessary you know obviously we can argue about whether or not they were necessary in the first place but you know at a certain point there would not be an excuse because now the war is going well now, for Ruth's aside, 1794 as a whole would be one of the less dramatic years of the war, but one which saw France further strengthening itself. Like in 93, France's fortunes came through a combination of both able French leadership and a lot of mistakes committed by the coalition. France's control over Belgium, won on the fields of Fleurus, would remain uncontested for the next 20 years. All right, enough about that war nerd shit. Let's get back to French politics. So, uh, we're, we're doing this because I uh, am a man who loves commitment and long-term getting things done. Ladies, hit me up. And last time, we spoke about phases one, two, and three of the French Revolution. So, now I'm going to do phase four. This is a phase of the French Revolution that almost no one ever talks about because it's like both short but also longer than you think it is, and it's like really weird and confusing for reasons we're going to go into. But just to recap, you know, through phases one, two, and three, we see constitutional monarchists lose control of the government as the war breaks out. Then we see radical Jacobins use the Parisian mob to get one over on their more moderate colleagues. Those radical Jacobins then secured their rule with bloody massacres in the famous Reign of Terror. And by summer of 94, Robespierre and other high-ranking members on the Committee of Public Safety had led their dictatorial ambitions turn into a paranoid bloodlust, uh, violence, was accelerated further and further until the remaining members of the National Convention decided their best bet for survival was to kill the radicals before the radicals could kill them. And this is called the Thermidorian Reaction. 
It's an awkward period of the narrative. Phase 4 is generally referred to as the Thermidorian Convention. That's what we're going to be calling it uh, moving forward. It's generally seen as like just like the little part of the revolution before the directory, and most people even skip over the directory, but I kind of think this might actually be the most interesting time of the revolution because it is the most aimless and the most like... Basically, there's a lot of different ways this could have shook out, and it's it's just kind of weird how it did. A lot of it happens in Phase 4, but it begins with the Thermidori reaction, with Robespierre and about a hundred of his allies all getting their heads cut off, and the terror being ended. And that was a spur-of-the-moment decision. You know, it basically happened, the decision was made over the course of about an hour as a about a hundred or so convention members looked around each other and was like, we gotta gag this guy, otherwise he's gonna kill all of us. And then there's a few days of fighting and a few days of execution, but after all of that, and Robespierre's head is in a ba basket, the National Convention is going to look around at itself and be like, well, now what? <laughs> and remember, France has gone through mass trauma at this point. Obviously, the war has been horrific. It's killed a lot of people. The terror has killed tens of thousands of people, like 16,000 in Paris, way more outside of Paris in the reprisals against the Civil War. And everyone could agree that the terror had to stop immediately. And the Thermidorian Convention is going to start by stopping the terror and then dismantling the authoritarian government structures that allowed it to happen. And one of the, I think, the more fascinating things about this period is it kind of shows us, like, how a dictatorial, authoritarian, like, terrifying, execution-happy government, like, can be dismantled and was dismantled, like, very effectively. Yeah, it's, it's kind of like a fascinating example of, like, you know, them pulling back from, you know, the worst possible outcome. And pulling back quickly. Yeah. Like, one day there's tons of executions, one day they just stop. Yeah. Yeah. Whereas July saw triple-digit executions in Paris, August saw less than 10. The laws that gave the terror teeth were repealed, and with the laws that had imprisoned them now off the books, almost 4,000 people were let out of the prisons of Paris. It's like this really awkward period where, like, you, you know, the... Thermidorian Convention gives the order, and then they go. Some guys got to go into the prisons and tell the guards, uh, just "Open all the doors." <laughs> yep. Like none of none of these people ha have to be here anymore. Yeah. We're, we're gonna get into like the trauma that the terror caused, and like Phase Four is essentially an entire society and also the city of Paris, like, dealing with the trauma of the terror. Like, dealing with a mass societal pain and trauma. And a part of that trauma was the fact that even though the terror was full of kangaroo courts and very, like, short, fast, quote-unquote, justice, uh, you know, you could be arrested and still rot in jail for months before the guillotine got you. And a lot of people were just, you know, thousands of people were lucky enough that the terror stopped before their heads were on the chopping block. But they had spent dozens of days in these cramped, awful prisons thinking that they were about to die. And uh, that tends to have a negative effect on people's psyche, which we are going to see the consequences of soon. But, Jay, keep telling me about how the terror is dismantled. Yeah. So you know, new deputies on mission were sent to the provinces to basically do the same thing. You know, these bureaucrats had a lot less power than previous appointees to cut down on abuses. The National Convention stripped the Committee of Public Safety of all powers except those of war and foreign affairs. Which were the one things that were, like, going well at the time. Yeah. New committees were formed to take over those responsibilities with term limits for every member. And there seems to have been a genuine desire to make up for the blood of the previous year. Many officials who had carried out the terror were prosecuted, along with many of those responsible for the thousands of deaths in the previous revolting cities. 
those of y'all who listened to the last episode will be glad to know that those guys who did the infernal columns and those mass drownings and whatnot, a lot of them actually are held responsible for their uh, actions. A lot aren't. Um, the I was only following orders excuse actually does work in this <laughs> period of history. We have not innovated that away yet, but... Some people are actually brought to justice for what they yeah. did. And there there was, like, an attempt by the government to make, like, to say that was bad and make up for it, which most governments don't. <laughs> yeah. You know, the new officials sent to these previously rebellious regions of France brought carrots instead of sticks and worked with the local governments to compromise. One serious step towards reconciliation was the denationalization of the church and the declaration of religious freedom. Lots of previously owned church land still belonged to the state, but the French were now free to worship as they pleased. And we're not going to go into the surprisingly complicated relationship religion has to the state in France, other than to say that, you know, Azalea, I know, finds it completely barbaric, but... They can all suck my fucking (laughs) cock. But just know now that people are free to do what they want in the privacy of their homes. Look, look up the policies of, of religious practice in France one of these days, if you want to compare it to what a country that's generally considered a peer nation to America thinks freedom looks like. If you, if you ever just, <laughs> just want, to, want, want to see a different take on things. Um, but yeah, so... First, we have the terror being rolled back and, you know, truth and conciliation and and reckoning with and yada yada. Then phase four is going to see French politics drift towards the right, both in reaction to the terror and in a cynical bid for power. You know, phases one and two of the revolution definitely saw things move more towards the left. I've kind of argued that phase three was not so much a... uh, turn towards the left as it was a bunch of dictatorial crazy motherfuckers just trying to seize power um but you know now things are going to move towards the right then this happens for a lot of reasons for starters many of the radicals are that they're dead that they're just not there anymore they're either killed in the terror or killed ending the terror uh, Robespierre killed a lot of people on his own radical Jacobin side before he got it out. He took out many of the most prominent radical leaders, Danton, Hebert. And after the terror, the left in general was rightly stained by its involvement in it, especially the Jacobin Club. Freedom of speech was generally expanded in Phase 4. And for the first time in two years, right-wing newspapers were actually allowed to publish unmolested and spread their ideas. Notably, the same freedom of speech was not afforded to the Jacobin Club, uh, which was forcibly disbanded. Laws were then passed to break the network of provincial Jacobin Clubs across the country. Uh, This really wasn't done for, like, political reasons. The... Uh, National Vision wasn't like, oh, the, the right wing is great, but the left wing is, is bad. It was more about like, hey, these Jacobin guys are like going to get us all killed, and they almost did get us all killed, so like, we're, we're, this is just <laughs> over. We're, we're just going to end this. But that means, of course, that the left is now not going to have its, its structures to meet and organize, right? Many of the politicians who pushed for the censure of the Jacobin Club and spoke out against the violence of the Parisian mob were once radical Jacobins themselves, of course. You know, these, these are all people who you know, came to power in 92 and 93, and they're simply rebranding themselves for a new political age. Many politicians who had been expelled from the National Convention during the terror were also welcomed back, and that made the body more conservative. Now, one could simply explain the rightward shift as a natural course of the equilibrium, After the suppression was lifted and the left was decimated, surely it's natural that the right would take power. But it's also interesting to see how the French Revolution inflamed a class war, which would end the political power of the Parisian mob. After many of the would-be victims of the terror were released from prison, they had time to process the trauma they'd been through. Turns out, spending a year watching people you know die and fearing for your life changes people. It makes them cruel and bitter, and in order to explain the class conflict that breaks out in Paris, we have to understand who the victims of the terror were. 
The average citizen of Paris became a victim of the terror because they were denounced, and an easy way to get yourself denounced was to be accused of violating the general maximum. Robespierre's government stabilized their power by winning over the Parisian mob and addressing their physical needs. With bad harvests and war inflation spiking the price of the food, the general maximum was a law that set the price for everything from a loaf of bread to a bar of soap. Internally, most of the legislatures, even the radical ones, believed in free market economics and knew this wasn't a great idea, but it was necessary to get the poor on their side. Shopkeepers, in turn, were forced to choose between selling their goods at prices that would ruin them or face the guillotine. During this front half of the podcast, when we were talking about all of these battles that are taking place in 92, 93, 94, remember, at the same time, the French economy is in shambles, and it's it's kind of being hauled along by brute force at certain points. Price controls work uh, for a few months, maybe a year, but unless you have, like, complete control over supply and whatnot, I can go on a whole economic rant, eventually you are going to have to pay that piper. And the effects of the general maximum would devastate the French economy, and they would also devastate the French shopkeepers who were, you know forced to sell their goods at ruinous prices and were constantly harassed. You know, these are people just trying to make a living while simultaneously being screamed at by poor people who are rightly angry that it's now costing triple to feed their kids. Uh, There's not exactly a good guy or a bad guy here. It's just that history is messy and bloody. The terror had generally seen the terror rising of small business owners and both the middle and upper class of Paris. These groups are always the backbone of any reactionary movement, and this would not be the exception. These groups were thirsty for revenge against the politicians and poor who had wronged them, and one of the messy things about this history is you can't really fault them for it. And this is where my favorite part of the French Revolution is going to go down. Uh, You know why, Jay? Why? Because the Proud Boys are going to show up. (laughs) By fall of 94, the Muscadin would appear. That's capital Muscadin is what these guys are called. Uh, This is literally French for those who wear musk perfume. They were young men from wealthy backgrounds who defined themselves by wearing the fancy clothes and perfumes that would have gotten denounced in front of a guillotine just months earlier. They roved around Paris in gangs, beating up the poor and anyone connected to the terror. They smashed busts of fallen radical leaders and were soon being organized by reactionary members of the National Convention to serve as unofficial bodyguards for the legislature. Just as the Parisian mob had allowed for the arrest of, just as the Parisian mob had allowed for the arrest of the Girondins, the Muscadin would provide the bodies to arrest many former Jacobins and try the, and try them for involvement in the terror. All while former Jacobins who had rebranded their politics were the ones organizing these Muscadin, of course. And I've already given it away, but if you're listening to this and are drawing certain parallels between this and uh, certain fascist militia organizations in the United States, <laughs> uh, yeah, it's, it, these guys are really similar, uh, with the only non-similarity being these guys are actually pretty good at doing what they want to do. 94 and 95 would also see many nobles who had fled the country during the radical years return and begin to exercise some power at the mostly local level. On top of that, many old allies in the moderate Girondins also wanted revenge, and this piled on to the bad blood from the civil wars of 93. What follows is the white terror uh, a lot of historians seem to disagree on like when exactly the white terror uh begins or ends it's called the white terror because white is the color of the house of Bourbon, and also traditionally in history uh we we tend to call royalists the whites not that all of these people are royalists it's complicated basically the white terror is describes a period of right-wing violence that is a reprisal against the terror. And while the reign of terror was organized by the state, 
the white terror is a citizen led affair yeah uh, all across the country of France. It was very common for imprisoned Jacobins awaiting their trial for what had gone down the terror to just be torn for their ja- from their jail cells and massacred by revengers. Dozens were killed all over the nation. And while Paris gets most of the ink, it's clear that the larger massacres took place in the provinces, which is also where the largest wounds of the terror were. Largest killing I found was of 700 Jacobins in Marseille. Uh, two quotes from French historian Albert Mateus help us get a sense of the nature of the White Terror. Quoting, Even those responsible for the September massacres had set up a semblance of a tribunal, presided over by the Millard, which did acquit some of the prisoners. But nothing of the sort was done during the White Terror. The killing was carried out without formality or phrases. And later on, uh, Mateus goes on to say, The agents of the Red Terror were gloomy fanatics who considered themselves to be acting legitimately in their own defense. They carried out their operations openly. They were often men of the people. Those of the White Terror often took the precaution of masking themselves before setting about their base task. They were men of good social position. Men with fine manners, who, having done the deed, went and related their exploits in the Salon of Melavus, who approved them and gave them their reward. Uh, my sense is that Mateus is a, is a pretty left-wing historian, but and his, his book is kind of colored with a lot of uh, colorful language and whatnot that sounds like something that I would write. <laughs> but um, Basically, just imagine a bunch of disorganized, small-scale mob attacks that are happening from, like, September of 94 all the way up into the summer of 95. Yeah. And it's also important to note that, like, people are affected by the political climate you put them in, right? Like, once violence gets normalized, once the seal gets broken, a lot more of it does when you hear that the citizens of Marseille killed a bunch of Jacobins that were responsible for the terror that inspires other people to take that action and of course a lot of these people are traumatized by the events of the terror and people have just seen a lot more people die and so now it's easier to keep the violence going you know this kind of spreads like a social contagion Now, while the White Terror was a disorganized revenge against radicals across the country, the most important action the central government would take in this phase would be to break the power of the Parisian mob. It's easy to see the Parisian mob as villains in the revolution. From the moment the legislators of France moved to Paris, the poor people of the city had been influencing them. You can argue these mobs steered the country away from democracy and fueled several coups that gave way to radical governments. You could also argue that they were starving people who did what they had to do to get political representation. There's a lot of moral conflict in this story, no matter how you slice it. Now, regardless, the Thermidorian Convention would not forget the danger of these mobs and would take steps to neutralize them. They already had the Muscadine as a counteracting force and had worked to disarm the people of Paris more generally through police raids and seizures of weapons. Also, just a, another like minor note relating back to the levee en masse. Uh, one of the things in the levee is that like you got to send all guns to the army. And that, you know, I'm sure obviously there are people who didn't follow that, but that did, you know, remove a lot of the guns from, you know, just the civilian population. Now, this time, around this time, the Parisian mob would also lack a singular leader and a faction within the convention to argue their side. There's actually this guy named Gracchus Babouf who will later rise in French politics who kind of could have been this guy, but he um, sort of mistimed his rise. He just kind of wasn't there fast enough. And also he was a vanguardist, which I'm not going to find because I do not want uh, this to break into a bunch of anarchists <laughs> arguing about what the best way to do a revolution is. But uh, yada, 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 vanguardism is, is stupid. It doesn't work. Yeah. Yada, yada, yada. Uh, uh, the conspiracy of equals, yada, yada, yada. He's the only cool person in the story. Uh, it's a story for another time. Whatever. Maybe don't name yourself after failed Roman populists. <laughs> I'll be a pretty interesting Roman populists. 
I'm assuming he named himself after the Gra- the Gracchi brothers, but I could be wrong. <laughs> he did. Okay, he did. Good. It's like just the weirdest coincidence otherwise. Now, while the poor of Paris also celebrated the end of terror in 94, by 95, they were in a righteous mood once more. The winter of 94 to 95 famously led to a lot of waterways freezing. This provided for fun trivia, like allowing for cavalry charges to capture a fleet in... I don't remember where that was. Um, I know what you're talking about. Let me look up. Yeah, but like, there, there is a time in this winter where like, the, the a bunch of ships are... are frozen in a river and a, yeah. and a bunch of people on horseback encircle them and like that's fun but you you know what you need r- flowing water rivers for jay white water rafting yes as well as grain mills <laughs> <laughs> in order to make fucking bread and the what what is the one thing that's been going on this entire revolution people have not had enough bread and of course, in the spring, all that water is going to melt, and it's going to flood, and that's going to once again cripple the mills. Now, add on to that war inflation and the repeal of the general maximum, and spring of '95 would see the complete collapse of the revolution's paper currency. This currency had seen ups and downs previously, but by April, it was trading at a fatal eight percent of face value. April would see the first hunger insurrections, but the most violent pushes of the Parisian mob would come on May 18th and 20th of of 1795. On May 20th, the streets of Paris would rise for their last shot at the poor affecting the government. Um, This story is kind of hard to tell. It's it, it. it's it's kind of it's it's complicated and a little anticlimactic for how important I'm making it sound. But here's what I could put together. In the morning, horns and toxin bells signaled the call to arms. Women ran around spurring men from their workplaces and into the streets. Uh, incidentally, women were at the head of a lot of these mobs and protest movements throughout this period of, of, of history. This is not a male-led affair. Arms caches were seized, and soon thousands were charging towards the uh, convention. They pushed past light musket resistance and stormed the convention itself. I've even seen speculation that the musket and kind of intentionally let them in because the right wasn't exactly happy at the convention either at this point, but that's speculation. But you have now taken the legislature, and you even have a platform. The crowd famously chanted for bread in the Constitution of 1793. They wanted their needs met, and the political rights the National Convention had promised but never delivered. Uh, Side note, uh, remember, the whole point of this legislative body was supposed to be to write a new constitution for France. That was why they were all elected in 92, and they still haven't done it. Like, they made a constitution in 93, (laughs) but then, like, immediately suspended it because it would have, like, you know, gotten them all kicked out of power. (laughs) Yeah. Um, What they lacked was strong leadership and enough connections amongst sitting convention members. Uh, I hate to make this comparison, but during January 6th, uh, you know, they kind of like got into the Capitol and then they just sort of like, well, now what? (laughs) What followed was a multi-day staring match between the army and the rabble. You might think this would conclude with a bloodbath, but... Every hour that passed, the poor grew more aimless. A lot of them are just kind of like going home, if only to like get food, go to bed. And more and more troops are surging into the city of Paris. By the fourth day, the barricades were lifted, the convention hall was evacuated, and everyone agreed to settle down. I'm actually kind of shocked that there was as little violence as there was. People really only got killed on the first day when the convention got stormed. What followed was the execution of a few convention members sympathetic to the poor, as well as a few leaders among the radicals. The poor were once again banned from joining the National Guard, and a bunch of their arms were were confiscated. There's not, like, a massive reprisal uh, against the poor Parisians to, like, break them and make sure they never do this again, but 
This will be the last time we see the Parisian poor as a pivotal force in the French Revolution. At least, that's French Revolution. And again, it's easy to villainize these folks as blood as a bloodthirsty mob that interrupted democracy, but again, uh, these people are mainly just trying to feed their kids, and also, none of these governments were particularly democratic in the first place. Yeah. The surviving May did not ensure the power of France's government. Even with the fractured hatred of the left, the remaining convention members felt little love from the resurgent right, who blamed them from the terror starting in the first place. The National Convention had started as a body with the purpose of drafting a constitution, and with their unpopularity clear, they put their noses down to work on one. By September, they had France's third constitution in five years, the Constitution of 1795. Phase five of the revolution would be the Directory, a cynical government that would make a further mockery of democracy as it desperately tried to balance the left and the right, cutting off whatever head stuck up the tallest. We'll cover the nature of the Directory and their fall during our episode on the War of the Second Coalition. All right, back to war, back to killing people. Well, killing people for war reasons. I, I actually, I, I, I killed a decent amount of people in my section, Jay. I, I think <laughs> I did good for myself. A guy got his head torn off and stuck on a pike while uh, they um, sieged the, the convention hall. I didn't mention that, but it happened. Yeah. Now, France's conquest of the Low Countries continued at pace into 1795 with French troops invading the Netherlands, a pro-French uprising known as the Batavian Revolution broke out in January, forcing the Dutch stockholder William V into exile. The newly formed Batavian Republic promptly allied itself with France. In June, the French conquest of the Low Countries was completed when Habsburg held Luxembourg, surrendered after a seven-month siege. French victories in 94 and early 95 also brought about an improvement to France's diplomatic standing. Prussia had already began to take a back seat in the conflict by 94, leaving much of the fighting to Austria and Britain. Prussia had entered the war in the first place basically just to gain territory at the expense of France, but now that that looked impossible, the Prussians agreed to sign a peace treaty at Basel in April ending their war with France and recognizing French control over the west bank of the Rhine in exchange for France returning all captured Prussian land east of the Rhine. Spain soon joined the Peace of Basel as well, which would bring the war in the Pyrenees to a conclusion. The summer of 95 would also see one of the most pathetic events of the War of the First Coalition, the Battle of Quiberon. A force of roughly 5,000 French émigrés was landed by the British on the Quiberon Peninsula in western France in an attempt to link up with local royalist forces. Damn, that would have been a great idea two years earlier. (laughs) But were subsequently defeated heavily by the French, with almost their entire force killed or captured. The forces of Quiberon would be a major blow to royalist efforts within France itself, discrediting discrediting them in the eyes of the many. As the Vendée region was in the process of being, quote, pacified by the French, any hopes of resistance from the countryside overthrowing the revolutionary government was now effectively over. This, I think, is one of the ma- the major uh, mistakes of the coalition, is, like, you, you, you have l- l- a French resistance. You have a civil war going on, and like which you could have, like, supplied or coordinated with or tried to negotiate with and you just kind of let that go to waste the only major french land defeat in 95 would be at Mannheim, where an austrian army would drive off a french attack and now that we have the prussians out the spanish out and the british quickly losing interest now that uh their control over uh, the netherlands is gone uh the austrians are gonna have to do their best yeah and actually the spanish will even switch sides and join the french in 96 but they don't really do much so we won't be talking about them much later but yeah so on to 1796 The penultimate year of the War of the First Coalition would arguably be its most famous, 
largely due to its serving host to the rise of Napoleon Bonaparte as a full-fledged army commander. Now, Napoleon's actions at Toulon in 93 had earned him a promotion to the rank of brigadier general, and through luck and timing, the Corsican had managed to remain in the good favors of both the committee and the directory. In 1795, Napoleon had helped the directory put down a royalist uprising in Paris, in the so-called 13 Vendemer, with his whiff of grape shot, uh, which is a fancy way of saying he fired cannons at riders. Great guy! <laughs> yeah. Now in March, Napoleon was given command of the Army of Italy, tasked with securing Sardinia's exit from the war. Now, for most of the war, the Italian front had been a bit of a sideshow. This I had, mean, we've kind of barely mentioned it. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, it's like, they kind of like trade Savoy and East back a few times, but it's not big fighting. This had not changed. Indeed, the French were preparing their main offensive of the year to be on the Rhine, with the states of the Holy Roman Empire as their target. Now, this means that when Napoleon arrived at his new command, he found an army that was poorly equipped, poorly supplied, and lacking in discipline. The front was such a low priority that the French were outnumbered by the coalition, you know, despite all that fancy levé en masse. The coalition had roughly 52,000 Sardinian and Austrian men in the area, while the French had fewer than 38,000. Napoleon also found himself in command of generals, Pierre Augereau, Philibert Sourier, and André Messina, who were his seniors in terms of both age and experience, and thus initially didn't really want to listen to some young Corsican dude. My understanding is at this point, the Italian campaign was like considered the the least glorious and a dignified place you could be as a soldier. Oh yeah, it, it in, was. In it, it was a low priority, and like a lot of the, like the like there were a lot of like royalists in 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 the army of Italy, just because like people who they didn't want to kill, but like they couldn't trust anywhere else, they just kicked down there, and like it was pretty low priority. And morale is low, yeah. and soldiers are kind of loafing around. They're not drilling properly. It's just kind of a mess. Yeah. And we will do more biography on Napoleon in the later episodes when we actually get to the Napoleonic Wars. Um, but yeah. Yes, yes. <laughs> the boy will be glorified, examined. I, I will stick my eyeballs up his asshole. We, we, we'll, 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 we'll tell you all about the man, the myth of the boy, Napoleon Bonaparte. But that is for another episode, because we are currently north of two hours of re recording time, and I want to get this fucking done. <laughs> In spite of all of these problems, Bonaparte... I'm leaving that in. Bonaparte launched his first offensive on April the 11th, not even two weeks after assuming command. A combination of his rapid operational pace and a lack of coordination between the Austrians and the Sardinians, because the, Sar the Austrians feared that the Sardinians were preparing to leave the war or switch sides, and they thus conceal many of their plans from their erstwhile allies, allowed for Napoleon to defeat the coalition forces, beating first the Austrians at Montnant, and then the Sardinians at Siva and Mondovi. By the end of the month, Sardinia sued for peace and formally ceded the territories of Savoy and Nice to France. Sardinia's surrender did not halt Napoleon, who shifted his attention to pursuing the Austrians and forcing them out of Italy. He sent General Surrier uh, to act as a decoy, pinning down Austrian forces near the River Po, while he maneuvered to the north and outflanked them forcing the Austrians to abandon the wealthy city of Milan without firing a single shot. By July, the army of Italy was laying siege to Austrians at Mant Mantua in Lombardy. My understanding, Jay, is part of what uh, starts to build Napoleon's reputation is that he makes his soldiers a lot of money during this time. Oh, yeah, they... they <laughs> Taking control of very rich Italian cities. Yeah, they extort a lot of money out of Milan. <laughs> and... And like it, it is in this campaign that you really see the beginnings of what Napoleon will be known for, which is a very fast, you know, operational pace. And he's a master of the operational level of warfare. And he's really good at what's called defeat in detail, where if he's faced with an army that's numerically superior to him, he'll maneuver in such a way that allows him to defeat one part of that army and then go and defeat another. 
basically picking them off one by one and thus not being outnumbered. And yes, yes, yes. It was all very, very smart. We'll, we'll go into it <laughs> yeah. in other episodes. Literally thousands of textbooks have been written <laughs> about how this guy did his stuff. So I'm sure we'll be able to explain it to you in full detail some of our time. Yeah. Now, as Napoleon fought his way through northern Italy, the French began their main offensive of the year, the Rhine Campaign of 1796. The French formed two large armies for this campaign, with General Jourdan in command of 78,000 men and General Moreau in command of 65,000. The Austrians, meanwhile, also had two armies in the area, 83,000 under General Wurmsmer and 92,000 under Archduke Charles, the younger brother of Emperor Francis II. Now, as one can tell, the Austrians actually had numerical superiority, but this would change as Wurmser was ordered to march with most of his army down into Italy to help shore up the defense against Napoleon. The French launched their attack in June, penetrating deep into Germany and forcing the surrender of several of the smaller states. Now, here is where the French government, you know, emboldened by this victory, ordered their two armies to separate and conduct two different offensives, one in the north into Bohemia, what's now the Czech Republic, and another down south along, along the Danube. This would prove to be a critical mistake, as Archduke Charles was able to regroup his men and prepare to defeat the French in detail, kind of just as what Napoleon had done in Italy. Charles left a smaller force to slow Moreau in the south and turned north, defeating Jourdain at Amberg and Würzburg and forcing him into a retreat before then turning south and forcing Moreau to retreat as well. My understanding is that Archduke Charles kind of like gets a bad rap historically and that if he had been in like other situations, he probably would have like done pretty good and been a hero and, and won. But it's just that he was up against Napoleon. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Charles has the misfortune of having to face, you know... The GOAT. Arguably, you know, the most brilliant, again, operational commander of, of the era. Like, Charles was very good at what he was doing. Tr truly the Kevin Nanny of his time. Yeah. Now, the Rhine campaign would end in defeat for France, but Archduke Charles was able to make a name for himself as one of the most capable commanders in the entire coalition. As Jordan and Moreau floundered in Germany, Napoleon continued to prosper in Italy. Napoleon defeated three Austrian attempts at lifting the siege of Mantua, most famously the Battle of Arcole in November when personally leading a flanking attack across a river on an Austrian army. By now, Napoleon had also reformed the Army of Italy, greatly improving its conditions in part thanks to the generous amounts of supplies and money that the good people of Milan uh, gave him for liberating them. And winning the loyalty of the divisional commanders, Surya, Messina, and Arginot, would all go to serve as marshals under the empire of Napoleon. Not content with letting the British and immigrants monopolize the category of ill-conceived amphibious operations in the War of the First Coalition, in December of 1796, the French launched an expedition under Lazar Hoche against Ireland. The idea was to land a French force in Ireland and encourage a local uprising. While the chances of success for such an effort were low, Hoche wouldn't get a chance to try, as the French fleet was destroyed by the stormy December weather before making a landing. Twelve ships were sunk and captured primarily due to weather but you know that idea of invading ireland that's that's that's, 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 you know, that's still a pretty good idea you should, you, should, you, you should do it you should really do it do it invade ireland do it do it do it do it you want to do it do it folks it's twelve thirty-five in the morning while we're doing this 1796 was thus a tale of two armies or i guess three if you count the thing they sent to the Ireland and army, for the French. In Germany, they had been decisively defeated, but in Italy, they stood triumphant. The events of the following year would determine the outcome of the war. Initially thought of as a sideshow by the French government, the Italian front would prove to be the backdrop for the end of the War of the First Coalition. Mantua would fall to the French in February of 1797, after a fourth attempt at lifting the siege was defeated by Napoleon at Rivoli. 
The surrender of Mantua freed up Napoleon to then invade across the Alps into Austria proper, which he did with great haste. If you're wondering, this is not Napoleon's famous crossing of the Alps, that will be a different um, crossing of the Alps. Shocked by the rapidity of their defeats and facing a French invasion, the Austrians sued for peace. Signing the Treaty of Leoben in April and the Treaty of Campo Formio in October, Austria ceded Belgium and an array of smaller territories to France and released the Italian states from their obligations to the Holy Roman Empire. The Republic of Venice, over a thousand years old, met its end at Campo Formio, while the Republic had remained neutral during the war. Its territory had been occupied by both Austria and France, and in the treaty it was partitioned between the two great powers. With the end of hostilities with Austria, only Britain remained at war with the French. Now, the French would make one additional attempt at invading the British Isles, landing just over 1,300 men near the town of Fishguard in Wales. As one would expect, the entire French force was defeated and captured by British reservists and militia. This isn't really that important. Uh, most people don't mention it. Most textbooks don't mention it. Maybe it's a footnote. But it is important partially because it's, it's, like, hilarious. Like, it involves, like, a bunch of, like, like Welsh fishermen's wives, like, like yelling at the French and, and s s sending them scurry with pitchforks. Uh, but also, this is the last invasion of the British mainland. Yeah, and, like, it's ever. It's a, a shit show. Like, from like the this top is the last down, time like. anyone is able to set hostile boots on Britain. Yeah, the, suck at Nazis. And this glorious French army was, like I said, like thirteen hundred dudes. A lot of them were prisoners because this was a penal battalion. Because you know, and those are going to be the people who are going to be loyal. They basically just land near Fishguard, and immediately most of these people just like start looting the countryside and there's no discipline like everybody just kind of breaks up and starts looting and because again like it's a fucking penal battalion like what do you what do you expect <laughs> and i don't know man my, my my penal battalion be getting up to quite a lot if, if you if you if you uh, sweet god how long as you mentioned there is a there's an episode where a bunch of the wives like put on, like, fake uniforms and just march around to, like, make the French think that the British have more soldiers in the area than they do. Because the British actually don't have a lot of soldiers, like, immediately in Fishguard. Believe it or not, they don't have a thousand soldiers just standing around a random village. Oh, they just have some reservists and militia. But, uh, nonetheless, because the French, you know, force immediately falls apart, the British are able to counterattack and kill and capture, mostly capture, and not many people actually die, the entire French invasion force. So yeah, thus went the final invasion of the British Isles. Something which France had tried, like, so many times throughout history. It's always, it's usually Ireland, but like, sometimes it's like Scotland or Wales, and it never works out. <laughs> No one is competent, folks. No one is competent. So, Jay, uh, why why did the first coalition fail? What was the what was the fatal flaw? Why does like most of the, all of the powers of Europe, sans Russia, fail to defeat a country going into economic turmoil? political turmoil and war against itself. Yeah, I think there are a few reasons. And one which should be remembered again is most of these countries did not want the war. They had war declared on them. We've mentioned this before a few times, but it's just worth remembering because most people overlook that fact. But beyond that, to me, it's the case of the coalition not functioning well as an actual coalition. The Austrians, Prussians, and British all have their own plans and their motivations, and they often don't work well together. And the Prussians more or less kind of dip out of the heavy fighting after 94. I mean, you know, sign a treaty in 95. So they just don't have a cohesive sort of leadership structure or just, you know, a plan on how to work together or coordinate with each other. And 
the results show. If, if they worked together, they probably would have won. Um, but I think also we do have to give credit to the French. And a lot of people don't, or if they do, they talk about it in simplistic terms of, like I said, you know, the massive French army of citizen soldiers overwhelming, you know, tiny little Austrian garrisons or whatever. It's or not they just give all the credit to Napoleon. Yeah. And the French, you know, start the war in a bad position. They fuck up a lot during the war, but they pull through. And I think a part of this is due to, you know, the reforms made, in particular by Carnot, which are very effective at restructuring the French military. And, you know, like I said, like the division system will be used by everyone else, you know, afterwards. And a lot of it also is the gaps left by the desertion of most of the French aristocracy meant that, you know, it was, it allowed for new people to rise to the top. And a lot of the generals were really bad. A lot of French officers, you know, who, who during this war fucked up and they lost battles or they were captured or they were executed. But when you get to the end of it, the people who remain, you know, the people who survived so far are generally really good. And this war will make, you know, the people who will be the heroes of, you know, Napoleon's army for, you know, the entire Napoleonic period. People like Jordan, Augereau, Soult, Serrurier, Sancier, these will all be Napoleon's marshals. These will be the people who will conquer most of Europe. And Napoleon himself is made by this war. You know, people don't like the great man theory of history because it's, you know, that's, you know, just limiting all history to like a, what individual dudes do. And it, it's true that the great man theory isn't, isn't correct. If it weren't for all the many factors that caused the French Revolution, Napoleon probably would have spent his day as a random artillery captain in the French army who nobody took note of. You know, maybe God made a career as a writer, a historian, because he was interested in those topics. But the revolution and the War of the First Coalition puts Napoleon in the position to use his talents to the best of his ability. And that's another thing that carries the French to victory. Because, you know, as, as we, we talked about, the war in Italy would kind of decide the entire war. And the previous French commanders, even though they were pretty good, people like Messina and Augereau, hadn't beaten the Austrians in Italy. Napoleon came and did it. And I don't know if I could say without Napoleon, the French would have won the Italian front, at least not as decisively as they did. So I think it's, you know, the fact that the coalition fuck-ups allow for the revolution to survive, then allows for the revolution to create these great military leaders who will go on to rewrite the book on warfare in the coming decades. Yeah, you know, uh, teamwork makes the dream work, and a lack of teamwork makes the nightmare work for you, and, and you lose the war. Uh, Jay, would you like me to wrap up by uh, talking about the political side? Sure. From here, we're going to go into a little bit of a break before we pick up with the war of the Second Coalition, and we are going to in a few weeks or months, uh, do that episode. We're going to continue with our tale of French politics and our tale of the French Revolution, which is weird for thousands of reasons we've already listed. But one of the things that makes the French Revolution weird is that it's incredibly front-loaded. All of the exciting things happen in 89, 92, 93, 94. And... As we've already seen, that's, like, wrong. Like, exciting things are happening all the time because there's a fucking war going on. But it is true the French Revolution will not peter out, but things will grow very mucky from here. In fact, historians are still debating today uh, when to end the French Revolution. When do you call it? And, uh... The solution to that, I think, is you shouldn't call it. You should just continue telling the story. And we will. So allow me to end this episode by setting up our uh, next episode in this series. Uh, you know, 
we have the directory now. We have phase five of the revolution. And even though you don't know a lot about them right now, you know, maybe you think they're going to have a good time of it. They're the ones who won the war, after all. They brought Prussia and Spain and Austria and Britain and all those little Italian and German states to their knees. But not really. Like, think about this war. Uh, to call France's politics chaotic in this time would be an act of supreme understatement. And the entire time all these events are going on, France is going through massive upheaval. But as terrible as that upheaval was, as terrible as the terror was, as terrible as the white terror was, it would have been far worse if not for the success of the French army on the battlefield. While the strength of the French government waxed and waned over the course of the war, the army only proved themselves more competent. They truly dragged France kicking and screaming over the finish line. The French government couldn't claim much credit for the success. Besides the Levee en masse, they did little to help the war effort. In fact, their political officers in the early days often disrupted the chain of command, and revolts against their rule provided the army with more battles to fight. Uh, I, I, you know, I, I think Du Maurier was a reasonably competent guy, and if they had been able to, to have his confidence and stuck him around, maybe he could have continued to do good work for them. I guess you could give the French government credit for stopping the country from completely collapsing into ruin, but that strikes me as faint praise. You, you know, the French succeeded because of the genius of their commanders, the strength of their men, and the folly of their enemies. And in spite of their own political leadership. It is easy to see how after the War of the First Coalition... The French people would have a lot more faith in the army than any elected leader, because no one is competent. That's going to do it for today, folks. Check us out on Twitter, at no one is competent at Azalea Wyatt, at jharrys48. Uh, please give us some love. Spread the podcast far and wide. Uh, like, subscribe, uh, flick your clit, um, do, do all of the, the finger majiggers, uh, the, the, the podcast is, is over now. I'm gonna go to bed. Bye! Wait! 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 Stop the music! Stop it! Stop it! The music for this podcast is done by the legendary Sam Bryce. Okay, resume the music. Go. Podcast is actually over now. Go, 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 go.